So hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome back to CCMB Biolog. For those of you who are new to this platform, this is a virtual webinar organized by the students of CCMB, where they network with leading scientists around the world and invite them to talk about their work. These talks are hosted live and also streamed on our YouTube channel, where also we get a lot of questions from the general public. So the typical format is about 45 minutes for the talk, and that will be followed by a question and answer session and interaction with the speaker. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our special speaker for today. Thank you so much, Professor John Matic, for accepting our invite and agreeing to talk to us. To start this session off, let me invite uh, Rakesh to introduce our speaker for the day. Rakesh, back to you. Uh, thank you, Surabhi. So, so first of all, uh, uh, thank you, John, for agreeing to spend an hour or so uh, with our students and speaking to them. Uh, uh, so just... Uh, for the benefit of the audience, John has done his bachelor's from the University of Sydney and PhD from the Monash University. And then he has postdoctoral training at John and Baylor College of Medicine. And now he is associated with the Garvan Institute of Medical Research. And uh, the uniqueness of uh, 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 John is that he does something very new and very different. He has established a new uh, kind of area or a domain of uh, genomics science and organization of uh, uh, programming of uh, uh, organisms, uh, particularly taking the meaning from the non-coding part of the genome in form of non-coding RNA, and then making a, a, a sense out of it. And as all of us know, non-coding RNA, regulatory role of such molecules is one of the very fast growing and fascinating field. So that is about the uh, academic and what he does. As a person, he is extremely uh, uh, friendly, very enthusiastic and full of energy. I remember I met him about 20 years ago in, in a small place called Kanpur. And he had uh, come there in Indian Developmental Society meeting and we had a, a very uh, 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 involved uh, discussion about Bithorax complex and its regulation. And, and he has ideas for 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 any uh, 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 genomics or gene regulatory kind of thing we want to discuss. And he's such a full of enthusiasm and motivation that I thought uh, it will be wonderful to listen to him. And he's very generous. I mean, uh, at some time we were working when we initially identified conserved non-coding sequences. He was so, uh, uh, so fair and generous that although his manuscript was accepted, he cited our paper, it was departed, and I can't forget uh, such things. Most people will like to claim and those kinds of things, but he's above such thing. And he has visited CCMB many times, at least a couple of times, I remember, and uh, he has given fantastic uh, uh, seminars, which uh, kind of, uh, which will vertex all of you to <laughs> start thinking differently, looking at things. So uh, 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 I, uh, um, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for accepting and uh, 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 to give this talk, this new platform that our students have initiated. I look forward to uh, hearing uh, to you. Thank you again. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Rakesh, and thank you, Zebra, for organizing uh, the seminar and inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great honor to, and a pleasure to come back. My only uh, complaint is that I don't get a chance to visit my favorite country in the world, <laughs> India. <laughs> and I remember the meeting in Kampur very well, which was my first experience in India. It was just fabulous, like it was. And intellectually and every other way, it was fantastic. So I better get in with it into the seminar because it's going to be very busy. And uh, so let me share the screen, if I may, and get going. I think that's the right one. Um, excuse me, I'll just go back. Okay, so can everyone see that fine? Yes, that's fine. Okay, great. So um, uh, just a few starting comments. This, as I said, this will be a, a very busy seminar because I want to paint a picture for you, a picture that I sort of started to develop uh, years ago when I first met Rakesh in Kampur. Um, that really, uh, I think we fundamentally misunderstood this, the nature and of genetic information, the structure of genomes, because of the assumption 
it's almost an example of the founder fallacy, um, uh, 50 or 70 years ago, based on bacterial genetics, that most genes encode proteins, which was a reasonable uh, assumption and conclusion at the time, but turns out to be incorrect. Um, in fact, as I'll show you, most genes in the complex organisms don't encode proteins, they encode uh, regulatory RNAs. So, but a bit of background first, I want to start with my favourite scientist, uh, Barbara McClintock, and this is her uh, front cover book about her, actually. The picture of her as a PhD student uh, in front of her beloved maze. And uh, a quote from this book, uh, so that, and the letter that she wrote to a friend is, um, is, is very prescient because she says, are we letting a philosophy of the protein coding gene control our reasoning? What then is the philosophy of the gene? Is it valid? Then she goes on to say, when one starts to question the reasoning behind the origin of the present notion of the gene, the opportunity for questioning its validity becomes apparent. Now, she was years ahead of the time, and even though she got the Nobel Prize in the 1980s for discovering transposition, uh, she was ultimately disappointed that people didn't really understand what she was getting at because what she was trying to say was that there were control elements, regulatory factors that were not proteins. And she can intuit that from her studies of maize. So, <coughs> excuse me, as, as I said, the assumption based on the studies of lac operon is that genes are synonymous with proteins, so gen most genetic information, including and specifically for purposes of this talk, regulatory information is transacted by proteins. Now, this protein-centric view re reflected the mechanical zeitgeist, a wonderful German word, which means the prevailing cultural paradigm of that age, and led to many subsidiary assumptions, despite a number of subsequent surprises that should have given everybody pause for thought. The, the surprise that brought me into the field as a postdoctoral fellow in Texas is that it was discovered, uh, and this was probably the biggest uh, surprise in history in molecular biology, that genes in complex organisms are mosaics of protein coding and non-coding sequences. And the immediate and universal interpretation was that these intervening sequences, despite the fact that they are transcribed into RNA, must be junk because they didn't fit the traditional conception of genes. But the equally, if not more plausible and far more interesting alternative is other information is being transacted by this non-protein coding RNA. The second surprise, which actually predated the first a bit, is that eukaryotic genomes are full of transposon derived sequences. And for decades, these sequences have been condemned as mainly non functional selfish DNA. And I could give almost another entire seminar on this, but I have to just make an assertion that it's clear to me, at least, and I think increasingly clear to everybody, that transposons are the main driver of evolution and the main. Uh, mechanism for reconfiguring regulatory networks in development. And that by and large, all of the transposon drive sequences in our genome have functions, including in transgenerational epigenetic inheritance through the uh, phenomenon of paramutation. But I digress, but I do recommend anybody to go and have a read about the tandem repeats uh, relationship to paramutation and transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. The third surprise, which came with the genome projects, is the number of genes in animals, at least, or most organisms, doesn't scale with developmental complexity. The, the interpretation, which was never justified uh, theoretically, mathematically, or mechanistically, is that combinatorial control of transcription and splicing can explain because it gives you, theoretically, um, so many possibilities. And these enduring interpretations, all examples of the founder fallacy, and there's a wonderful article by Mark, Mel, Mark Halfin in 19, sorry, 2019 on this topic with respect to enhancers. So let's have a look at the genetic specification development. I want to have you think a bit about this rather than just the normal reductionist biochemistry and molecular biology that most of us do most of the time. So, uh, and, and uh, forgive me, a few points in this talk, I've got some text because I want to make the, some points clear, um, and I'm happy to, you know, send around a PDF of the talk afterwards for people to review. So, first of all, you know, is this, the number of repertoire of protein coding genes that remains remarkably constant across the animal kingdom, despite orders of magnitude differences in cell number and developmental complexity. So, if we look at this comparison, we humans um, have approximately the same number of protein coding genes as the, the uh, nematode worm C. elegans. Now, the nematode worm on the, worm on the right here is only one millimeter long and only has 1,000 
or so somatic cells, whereas the human on the left has something of the order of 50 trillion cells, exquisitely, as I'll show in a moment, organized in precisely into muscles, bones, and organs, and a brain with 100 billion neurons. Uh, what's worse is that most of the encoded proteins between these organisms are orthologous, orthologous and have similar functions. So the question is, how much information is required to program the hum human development and cognitive capacity, and what form does it take? So I just want to have you reflect on the structure of bones for a minute, because apart from the brain, these are the most architecturally diverse and complex uh, organs that we have. And these are just three vertebrae from, uh, from different parts of the spine. And you can see in three different planes, and you can see just the exquisitely precise architecture that is quite characteristic of each individual vertebra in the spine. So it's not simply a matter of specifying uh, bone cells, you know, osteoclast and osteoblast. It's, it's architecture, which is the real challenge for development. So we have to go from a single cell at the point of conception to a walking, talking uh, adult with 50 or so trillion cells organized in this exquisite patterns of bones and think about not just the vertebrae, but the flat bones of your face, the fine bones of the ossicle in the ear, the long bones of the legs, et cetera. And the same with muscles and tendons. So here, just look at the left picture, for example, of the, the sort of diagram of the leg, and you can see the exquisite arrangement of different muscles and linked by ligaments to different bones, et cetera. All of this has to be specified by development and in the human genome. Now, if you compare this, the ontogeny of that worm, C. elegans, which was well worked out by John Salston and others in Cambridge, there um, is a well-established and quite invariant, except for mutants, developmental patterning of uh, the cell divisions during the ontogeny of the worm. And uh, whereas in a human, we've got, that's got 10,000 leaves in that uh, developmental tree, but a human, we have 50 trillion. Imagine the complexity of that. And that developmental uh, program is, is extremely robust. And that's shown by uh, just comparing uh, superficially uh, identical twins. Because if you run the same program twice with all of the idiosyncrasies that we inherit from our ancestors, you get phenocopies. So that one cell is organized to um, produce you know, these beautiful individuals in, in a way that's completely reproducible if that program is run twice, almost completely reproducible. And if there's any noise in the system, uh, it can't be it can't be very relevant because uh, you know these these individuals are essentially identical. Now, just to reflect on the fact, put in informational terms, the haploid human genome contains 3.3 billion base pairs. And if you convert that to binary terms, that's 6.6 .6 billion gigabits or 825 megabytes, which is far less than the, uh, uh, the amount of information required to program Microsoft Word. And the idea that most of the genome is junk is just completely antithetical to this information uh, perspective on, on what genetic information. Now, just a few quick assertions. The, the assumption that combinatorics of transcription factor interactions have sufficient power to control the development of a worm or a human rests on a Boolean model of gene regula regulations never been justified mathematically, theoretically, or mechanistically. It's also at odds with the quasi-quadratic increase in cell number relative to total gene number in prokaryotes, something we did years ago, but I don't have time to dwell on. The widely held belief that many long non-coding RNAs are not conserved is based on a circular argument, and this is just to put these things out, out on, off the table, which assumes that recognizably homologous ancient repeats or transposon derived sequences are firstly not functioning, and secondly, rep not representative of the original set and common ancestor and that can therefore be used to measure the neutral evolution rate, which was done in the human mouse genome comparison, which is incorrect on both counts. Third point I'd like to make to you very quickly is that regulatory sequences, including promoters, evolved rapidly under far more relaxed structure function constraints than protein coding sequences, and under positive selection for adaptive radiation. Phenotypic diversity in complex organisms is mainly achieved by regulatory variation. Most of the human genome is not devoted to biochemistry or physiology, although that's the lens through which we study it, usually, but rather to the regulation and development. And most cell culture assays completely miss this, as does most biomedical research. So let's just get into some data now, and uh, forgive me for moving quickly through this because a lot of it's been published. 
So we know that the extent of non-coding DNA increases with developmental complexity, and uh, I won't walk you through this graph, but uh, it's it's pretty obvious that the more complex the organism, the greater the proportion of the genome that is um, uh, occupied by non-coding DNA against a relatively constant proteome, at least in the animals. So we know now that irrespective of the extent of these non-coding sequences, the vast majority of the genomes of complex organisms is dynamically and differentially transcribed in different cells and tissues at different developmental stages. So you're forced to the conclusion that either there is an enormous amount of useless transcription, or there is another layer of genetic information transacted by RNA, which expands in complex organisms. Now this data came out of the transcriptome studies in the mid 2000s, particularly, and I think most compellingly out of the Reekins uh, group and the Phantom Consortium, which I was uh, privileged to be a member of. And this paper, which came out in Science in 2005, it was motivated by high throughput uh, RNA sequencing to try to define better the proteome and the spliceome. But ultimately, the headline result was unexpected uh, that this analysis identified tens of thousands of transcripts with no, little or no protein coding potential. The accompanying paper, we showed that at least 70% of mouse genes exhibit overlapping antisense transcripts. And um, that produce some preliminary evidence that these might have a regulatory function. In fact, I just mentioned here that when you look at genomes all the way from bacteria to humans, the amount of the genome that's transcribed is actually well over 100% because much of the sec other strand is also transcribed in a developmentally regulated manner. And a few months earlier, uh, Tom Gingeris and colleagues at Appometrics using a totally different technology, genome tiling array, showed much the same thing. And they also showed something that's in danger of being forgotten for the second time. And that is that almost half of our transcripts are not polyventilated uh, and it's comprised a different set of sequences, probably either coming from introns or, and or transcribed by pole three. Oops. So even uh, you know, 15 years ago, uh, it was obvious that the mammalian transcriptome was incredibly complex with small RNAs like microRNAs and cell RNAs in the, in the introns of uh, protein coding and non-coding genes, overlapping genes, genes within, within introns of other genes, et cetera. And even when we drew this uh, cartoon that 15 years ago, it was clear this was an oversimplification of the actual landscape. In every cell, in the, the uh, start sites, the splicing patterns of polyadenylation sites, et cetera, are all different. Now, um, we also showed on route that long non cutting RNAs are not um, uh, unstable, that they have a very similar half-life of uh, cellular half-lives as messenger RNAs. And um, some of them are highly uh, quickly turned over as are some proteins like transcription factor messenger RNAs, but others are very stable. They also have all the features, conventional features of genes in the sense that they have uh, conserved promoters. In fact, enigmatically and still not well under uh, understood is that the promoters of long long coding RNA genes and I'm mainly talking about long non-coding RNAs today, not microRNAs, uh, are more highly conserved than those of protein coding certain genes. And I interpret that to mean that's because of their highly cell-specific expression patterns, which we'll get to in a moment. They've conserved splice junctions, genetic sequences, et cetera. They have um, altered expression of, splice, of splicing in cancer and other diseases. Their uh, genes are associated with conventional chromatin signatures. Their expression is regulated by morphogens and transcription factors, and they show very specific expression patterns. And this is this uh, work we did some years ago with the Allen Brain Institute, but I think it's very compelling. So this is looking at the in situ hybridization patterns of over a thousand long non coding RNAs in mouse brain. The first set of uh, panels is the primary data, and the second is the computer transformation, which gives a better uh, 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 contrast. And if you look at panel B, for example, there's a long non coding RNA there that is, as far as we know, only expressed in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. And panel C, one that's only expressed in the uh, CA1 field of the hippocampus. Now, if you look at those panels, for example, and uh, if you mushed up those brains, you'd hardly see these transcripts because they're only expressed in a very small number of cells. They're not lowly expressed, as is commonly thought, at all they're actually quite highly expressed, but in very specific cell types. So when you do RNA-seq in complex tissues, you, you get a low signal and you get beautiful patterns in the cortex and cerebellum as well. 
And this is quite typical. We get uh, most of the RNAs uh, we, uh, we looked at were expressed in brain, and uh, most of those were very highly cell or region specific. They also showed very precise subcellular locations. 30% or so um, uh, seem to be cytopl well, are cytoplasmically located, and we still don't know what these all do, but it's a very intriguing subcellular cell biology that needs to be explored. Most of them are nuclear localized and chromatin associated. I'll come back to that. Others are decorating still unknown uh, sub uh, nuclear domains, in, and this is in cerebellar cells. We thought these were centrosomes, but they're not. So there's an unknown uh, subnuclear domain yet to be discovered and characterized in centrosomes. Others uh, have multiple foci, which turn out to be paraspectals, and others are neurite specific. And in fact, um, with David Spector at Cold Spring Harbor, we showed that one of these more highly expressed non encoding RNAs is a uh, core component of paraspectals, which is um, a mammalian specific subnuclear domain, uh, which is still enigmatic because they, you don't find these paraspectals in birds. And yet birds have bones and muscles and livers and brains. Uh, so their uh, function in mammals uh, is still enigmatic, but it may have to do with their retention of, uh, and of edited transcripts, something I'll get back to later. Uh, another one of these uh, more highly expressed long encoding RNAs uh, decorates a novel nuclear domain in a subset of neurons. This is Shinichi Nakagawa's work in, in, in Japan. And uh, later on with Shinichi and uh, Seth Blackshaw, uh, Hopkins and others, we showed that this is an acutely downregulated in response to neuronal activation and actually uh, produces modified spliceosomes that change the splicing pattern in ways that are redolent of what occurs in schizophrenia. Um, now, it's also clear that we still haven't got anywhere near understanding the full extent of the transcriptome in, in humans in complex uh, tissues. Uh, so uh, to try and get to this uh, better handle on this, uh, one of my brilliant postdocs, uh, Tim Mercer, uh, developed a technique called RNA capture seq with John Rin at uh, the Broad Institute. At that, he's, at that time, he's now in Boulder. And so basically, this is the RNA seq equivalent of exome sequencing. And you you develop you make capture array uh, oligonucleotide arrays that hybridize to RNA seq from expressed from genomic regions of interest. You wash away the ones that don't bind, you then sequence them. So here's the first experiment, the one we published some years ago. And this is uh, this circos plot here uh, indicates regions of the human genome that are lowly expressed in fibroblast in culture. So I'd like you to just concentrate on the oops, the um, the lower left uh, segment there, where we see oh, no tr evident transcription in that from that part of the genome in fibroblast in culture. So we made beta rays to, uh, to, to capture transcripts from that section of the genome from the same cDNA prep that we used to generate this data in the first place, and then resequenced it. It's like a molecular microscope. And this is what we saw. We saw that these areas, which looked like they were gene deserts, uh, were actually alive with transcripts, and each arch here is a splice junction. So they're alive with transcripts that are alternatively spliced. And that means that there's a subset of cells in this culture which are in different transcriptional state. We did the same thing for protein coding regions and saw extraordinary complexity as well, even in well-studied uh, genomic gene uh, loci like p53. And I won't dwell on this, but I have to go, go further. But now uh, the point here is that RNA seq, particularly of complex tissues, can badly mislead in terms of uh, what's in there, and and. and People trying to construct um, regulatory networks from this sort of data are really walking through a minefield because uh, if things are going up in one sort of cell in the population, but down in another, they're not necessarily correlated. So keep that in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this, uh, this is one that will come back to us later. And that is, if you look at the pre-capture uh, RNA-seq, we found three exons, two splice junctions. But when we actually amplified the signal, we got this extraordinarily complex, multi-exonic and almost universally alternatively spliced long non-coding RNA transfer. And we should have taken more notice of that at the time, but we'll come back to that. Uh, but just to summarize, I can say that most long non-coding RNAs are underrepresented in the uh, sequence databases because they're, they're undersampled and most of them are multi-exonic and almost universally alternatively spliced. <coughs> 
So we decided to look at um, long coding RNAs in uh, regions identified by genome-wide association studies, which are often, again, uh, uh, thought of as being gene deserts. And I, I won't walk you through uh, genome-wide association studies and Manhattan plots, but we looked at, um, oh, before I say that, uh, the, the, the thing about uh, genome-wide association studies is that unlike Mendelian disorders, which are overwhelmingly catastrophic damage to protein, protein coding sequences, which, which you're lucky to survive, most of the variations that affect complex diseases and traits occur not within protein coding sequences, but within uh, intronic and endogenic sequences, presumably regulatory. Uh, so we made a custom seq array to target GWAS regions for uh, about 150 conditions, covering about 2% of the genome and then looked at what we found. So here's one example here. The red uh, block is the haplotype block that's polled by the uh, Sentinel SNP. Um, and down the bottom is what was in, in the databases, which was essentially nothing sitting in that haplotype block. But when we actually, when we looked at it in, in fine detail, we see a non-coding RNA gene sitting right in the middle of this haplotype block, which has to be a prime candidate for the mechanistic basis of uh, the, the variations in cognitive performance that have been mapped to this particular haplotype block. So that's the sentinel SNP, and then that's the long non-coding RNA. We, we, another haplotype block in red here, we found three long non-coding RNAs, multi-exonic, alternatively spliced, sitting right in the middle of this block, which are, uh, clearly have to be candidates for whatever the molecular basis of the variation observed in populations might be. We did the same thing for neuropsychiatric conditions uh, in more detail, and I don't have time to go through this in detail, uh, that's published. But we looked at a thousand haplotype blocks uh, that are associated with neuropsychiatric tra traits. We found most of them actually produced novel multi-exonic uh, long long coding RNAs, most of which are not, were not yet at that time recorded in gene code annotations. Over the years, we've looked at dynamic expression of these things in different systems, embryonic stem cell development, neuronal cell differentiation, T-cell activation, muscle, memory development, chest cancer, and melanoma. And I just want to give you a couple of vignettes from this to illustrate a few more points. But I'd say before I do that, that we now have well over 10,000 publications showing biological effects associated with one or other long, long coding RNAs. And I should also say that uh, there are around, by my guess, somewhere between 300 and 500,000 long, long coding RNA genes in the human genome, which interestingly is very similar for the estimated number of enhancers. And we'll come back to that. So here's uh, some experiments of years ago looking at differential expression of long, long coding RNAs in mammary development. We did differential expression. We picked this one, which uh, showed this is a, a, an antisense RNA that's near but not overlapping a zinc finger transcription factor gene which is highly expressed in pregnant mammary gland that's turned off during lactation, keep that in mind, but uh, then turned back on again at weaning. This, uh, this RNA is remarkably stable, half-life, uh, compared to the nearby protein coding sequence. It's almost bulletproof, probably because it's chromatin associated. Uh, if you knock this down, now remember, and this is in mammary epithelial cells in culture now, uh, remember, this is down-regulated in lactation. If you knock it down in memory epithelial cells in culture, you see an increase of the proliferation of these memory epithelial cells in culture. And you see on the left of this last box, uh, an increase in the number of domes that form at confluence in these cultures. But most importantly, and most compellingly, on the far right, these memory epithelial cells in culture, when you knock down this RNA, which is uh, repressed in lactation, start to produce milk or casein at least. So this is a long non-coding RNA that is controlling, uh, we conclude, the epigenetic state of these mammary epithelial cells and switches them from being quiescent to, to milk producing. We also looked at, uh, with Ranjan Pereira in Florida, the uh, long non-coding RNA associated with melanoma, and we picked this one, which is uh, derived from the intron of this protein coding gene from the other uh, orientation. This one's small enough to get a reasonably accurate two-dimensional projection of structure. It allows me to make a few points. First of all, RNAs are not uh, sort of linear molecules with A stuck on the end of them, and they're highly complex three-dimensional structures. And 
the, 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 these structures can then bind proteins and, uh, uh, to, to, as cargoes, and yet they have open sections on the left there which are potentially able to recognize cognate sites in, in, in the genome. When you now remember this one is upregulated in melanoma, if we knock it down in melanoma cells in culture, we, we completely ablate or nearly completely ablate the evasion, evasiveness of these cells. And uh, we also showed by scratch tests that it changes the, the, their migration frequency. So this is one of the more powerful metastatic associated genes. Clearly uh, has no protein coding capacity on this short RNA, but has profound effects on the behavior of the cells. We also looked at uh, differential expression of these things in non-coding, uh, sorry, in the ES cell differentiation. All of the things on this graph, except for two in white, are non-coding RNAs that are being varying over orders of magnitude during ES cell differentiation and culture. I want to concentrate on the EBX1 antisense and uh, Hox B6 and B5 antisense, and this is the structure of the gene. If you look, first of all, at the bottom, the EBX1, which is a homeobox uh, gene, um, has this antisense transcript on the other strand. And you look at the interlacing of the exons, the exquisitely precise organization of these two genes. Uh, the HOXB5, B6 uh, antisense RNA actually covers the whole locus. So um, what we did uh, was to uh, look at whether these um, RNAs were associated with trithorax, mixed lineage leukemia one, and with H3K4 trimethyl, which are markers of active chromatin. We found that HOXB5, B6 antisense RNA is associated with and comes down, pull down with these, with antibodies against these uh, proteins or structures. The messenger RNA HOXB6 doesn't, the EVX1 antisense does, but the HOXA11 antisense doesn't, that's probably associated with collagen. So this is among the first evidence that differentiation induced transcripts antisense development of genes associated with chromatin modifying complexes and modified histones. So I have to say, this is their major function, not their only function, but their major function. Now, as you know, epigenetic processes are central to differentiation development, although that is not as well emphasized as it could be, uh, also because long, it's, it's, uh, they're also central long-term responsible responses to environmental variables like in type 2 diabetes and brain function. Uh, and, and all of these things are extremely important um, uh, processes controlled by epigenetic memory. Now, the epigenetic memory, as you also know, is, is, is embedded in the methylation, hydroxymethylation of cytosines and DNA in a very wide range of modifications, histones of packaged DNA into nucleosomes. These modifications are cat catalyzed by a suite of 100 generic enzymes, <coughs> excuse me, or chromatin modifying complexes and impose a myriad of different uh, marks at hundreds of thousands, if not millions of locations in different cells at different stages of differentiation. Uh, just as a little aside, something you probably don't know, but which I think is extraordinarily interesting, that in the brain, the neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine, are actually covalently linked to histones to modify the chromatin in uh, cells in the brain, which means there's an active interplay between neurotransmission uh, activity and epigenetic uh, processes in the brain, which I think has very profound implications. The question is, then what determines the site selectivity of these enzymes? Because these enzymes have no intrinsic DNA uh, motif recognition, and they're just enzymes. And they impose these marks in very uh, dynamically at different places around the genome. <coughs> Another question, which I won't answer today because it's been published, but what determines the positioning of the nucleosomes? And it's clear that nucleosome positioning is very well, highly controlled. And what's the molecular basis of the epigenome environmental interactions? And the answer to all three of those questions is RNA. Now, when we were doing tri uh, trithorax, which is an activating complex, other groups, Peter Fraser in Cambridge and uh, Kanduri in Uppsala, were doing the same sort of things with polychrome. And here's a couple of uh, cases, including the very famous non-coding RNA from the IGF um, to receptor locus that silenced transcription by targeting polychrome to chromatin. This uh, observation was writ large a year or so later by John Rin and colleagues who did looked at over 3,000 long long cutting RNAs and found that fully 20% of them were bound by polyca, <coughs> PRC2, and that others are bound by other chromatin modifying complexes. And they showed that the depletion of certain uh, these RNAs led to upregulation of their gene expression. <coughs> 
So this uh, you know, shows in the, in the broad that a, a large fraction of these long, long cutting RNAs are associated with epigenetic uh, complexes and processes. <coughs> it's also true that um, enhancers produce long, long coding RNAs, and they were thought for a long time to be uh, just byproducts of the activation of the uh, promoter of these things. And you'll see diagrams where the, the enhancers are proposing uh, are proposed to act by transcription factors binding to the enhancer promoter, contacting the promoter of you know, target protein coding genes. But this there's never been any evidence for this. There is evidence for for chromatin reorganization, but that's another example of the founder effect, founder fallacy, I should say. And it's increasingly clear, although well, I don't have time to, to give you all the evidence, that um, uh, enhancers actually act through the agency of the long, long coding arms they produce, which are probably involved in organizing the local topological domains of the chromatin to bring different genes into enhanced uh, sorry, transcriptional hubs. So um, to cut a very long story short, and this goes back to papers we published in 2001, it's been obvious to those who are looking that uh, both long, long coding RNA is involved in guiding chromatin repressive complexes and activating complexes, but also interplaying with the RNA interference pathway in very complex ways that we don't understand to regulate the structure of the chromosome, the chromatin and the patterns of gene expression during development. And uh, you know, in diagrammatic fashion, it's, uh, it's clear also that uh, long, long coding RNAs have functional domains. They can bind to RNA, they can bind to proteins, they can bind to DNA through R loops or triplexes. And they probably, like they can in bacteria, act as conformational switches. They can act as control devices, scaffolds for attracting proteins, and uh, as guides to take these proteins to particular locations in the chromos chromatin at particular points in this very complex ontogeny of uh, 50 trillion cells to make to, to, to direct the patterns of gene expression at every, st every stage of development. Here's one of my favorite pictures, which is an immunofluorescence uh, micrograph of, of uh, interface chromatin uh, in human fibroblasts using anti uh, triplex antibodies. It looks like the Milky Way. There are these, uh, and this, these things are probably, as we'll get to, phase separated domains that are all topologically associated domains around the chromatin. Now, one of the things we looked at because we wanted to try to put some sense into this system is to actually try to understand what are the structural functional relationships in these long, long cutting lines. It's clear, as I'll come back to very briefly, that they are modular uh, and alternatively spliced. So we, we looked at uh, the, the conservation of structure rather than sequence in these, uh, in these RNAs. And this was done mainly by Martin Smith, who now he's, uh, has his home lab in Montreal. And what we did was to fold the DNA into predicted RNA structures. And you see one there near his photograph. And then look to see whether that structure was preserved in the face of sequence variations in an evolutionary series. In other words, if there was a, a change in one nucleotide was a compensatory change in another that preserved the stem or in the structure. And on this basis, we were able to establish that at least roughly 20% of the human genome, this is a minimum estimate, is conserved on the basis of, cons uh, sorry, is you know, of conserved RNA structures. Uh, we also, working with Howard Chang at Stanford, were able to uh, validate this by looking at biochemical probing, excuse me, uh, and comparing that with our predictions. And, the biochemical programming and our predictions went match very well, which validated each other. I don't have time to go into this data, but it was published a few years ago. Um, and then we've been more recently uh, profiling these evolutionary conserved structures into probabilistic models of two-dimensional motifs. And you can see here's another one here. And you can group these into two families. And we basically have done that. We have something of the order of 10,000 or more different families of conserved structural motifs, although that's a very rough estimate. And when you map their positions around the genome, you see that some are, uh, are located in very many places around different chromosomes. Others are quite chromosome specific. And we think that these are module elements like polycomb binding domains or trithorax binding domains that have been recruited largely by transposition, I might say, into different long, long cutting RNAs to, for uh, the evolution of adaptive radiation to change developmental profiles. 
Now, um, we, we've looked at uh, the new chromatic region chromosome 21 in a lot of detail by Capture Seek, and we got an extraordinary enrichment of the uh, transcription of the RNA seq coming out of that. And, uh, this is coming from mainly from brain. And what we found uh, interesting, and you just fight aside here, is that uh, the link RNAs, as I mentioned, are almost universally alternatively spliced, which was not uh, obvious from the RNA seq databases because they're so poorly polled by most uh, uh, transcriptome experiments. We found that um, the messenger RNA exons were less alternatively spliced, but still 70%, uh, which turns out for reasons I'll show you in a moment to be an overestimate. But the fact that long long cutting RNA exons are uh, almost universally alternatively spliced means they must be modular. And if they're modular, it means that each exon is actually a modular unit, which is probably um, binding a particular uh, subclass of protein. And we're trying to, to work that out now by looking at the ECRIT data sets and uh, seeing where the predicted structures are, are uh, enriched. Now, these are real splice junctions. They're not, uh, they're not, this is not noise. And so this is an evolutionarily selected phenomenon. When we looked at the, the synthetic regions in mouse, we got essentially the same result, but we found that um, that the alternative splicing of mouse exons in protein coding genes was much lower, less than half of that in humans. And that's been known for a while, but the reason for it hasn't been so clear as I'll show you in a moment. It turns out that nearly all of this uh, increased alternative splicing in humans is actually in regulatory non-coding regions of the messenger RNA. So if you look at the DERK1 A gene, which is in the um, Down syndrome critical region of chromosome 21, you see that the protein coding region in blue at the right-hand side is constitutively spliced to maintain the open reading frame. And that's pretty common for protein coding uh, messenger RNAs. It, you see some alternative splicing in, the, in these sequences when you've got multi-domain proteins, but by and large, the splicing pattern maintains an open reading frame. But what you see is an extraordinary complexity of new five prime exons in humans that don't exist in mice and an extraordinary uh, uh, variation in the alternative splicing, which means that the regulation at the five prime end of these messenger RNAs is much more complex and sophisticated in humans, probably because of cog cognitive um, evolution. And that's just the summary, so I'll move on. I, I, I tossed up whether to put this in or not, and I probably regret doing it, but I wanted to just make a point that most people don't understand and don't know, I, nobody understands, is that the three prime UTRs of messenger RNAs are expressed separately from their normally associated protein coding sequences and transmit information in trans as long long coding RNAs. And <clears throat> here's an example from the myatom gene, where the coding sequences expressed in the cytoplasm of interstitial cells in the testis, which is not surprising, but the probe for the um, UTR shows a totally different pattern. And it's highly expressed, looking on the right here, in the nuclei of German Sertoli cells, totally different expression pattern. And uh, as far as we can tell, in the few examples we have, these things are expressed in the nucleus uh, in a subset of cells. Now, normally this UTR is, is associated with the protein coding sequence. We know that from, from cloning and sequencing experiments, but by our estimation, up to half or more of all protein coding genes have separate expression of their UTRs in one cell type or another. Here's another example in the brain where the coding sequence is the hippocampus is, is not expressed as far as we can tell in the, in the hippocampus, but the UTR is blazing, particularly in the dentate gyrus. And in fact, this, um, uh, different, this uh, expression of UTRs is actually quite tissue specific. So if we look at um, uh, this, the cortex, we see a start site for two start sites for these UTRs. <clears throat> they are capped, but <clears throat> I don't have time to show you the data, but they're not separately, it's not a separate promoter because the, the start sites of these genes don't have any of the conventional features of promoters and like chromatin marks. But anyway, that's cortex and here's the hippocampus. And uh, we see also see a particular start site, uh, which I'll come back to in uh, the Oscar gene in, in flies. So over the years, but ad hoc, there's been a number of studies that show that three prime UTRs on their own can regulate growth and differentiation in cell cultures and in mouse models. And <coughs> in this is trapped. Oops, sorry. This is, you know, um, well, this is a bunch of genes, but tropomycin. Uh, ribonucleotide reductase, R1 and R2 of all things, and, um, and prohibits it in breast cancer. 
And in all cases, uh, these studies, which are done accidentally, show the free prime UTR associated RNAs inhibit cell division, suppress malignancy, induce differentiation independently of, and in addition to the regulation of messenger RNA translation and stability. An astounding observation, which doesn't make any sense in the current conception, either in molecular biological or evolutionary terms. But um, so the, the, the massive expansion of UTRs during vertebrate evolution has clearly got something more to do than just controlling the expression of protein, the expression of protein coding sequence. And here's a lovely experiment from Anna Frusi's lab where she shows, and she and her colleagues show that um, the expression of the three prime Oscar UTR is sufficient to rescue the eggless defect of the RNA male mutant. Oscar mutants uh, lack oogenesis, but you can recover it by the UTR alone. Amazing. And uh, as we showed in our papers, but also done more um, fully uh, by Mary Hines and colleagues, this is particularly uh, evident in the brain. So I want to switch gears now, and um, I should just make check check the time. Um, but this related. It's been the epiphany, I think, for the field in the last uh, five years or so is that um, we have uh, RNA mediated subcellular domain formation. And it turns out that um, most, if not all, subcellular domains are phase separated domains nucleated by RNAs interacting with proteins containing intrinsically disordered regions. These include nucleoli, and we've all been looking at nucleoli for years. No membrane, but they're quite discrete territories. But includes cagel bodies, paraspectral spices, G bodies, etc. And here's a nice review from a few, couple of years ago from uh, from uh, Magdalene Pulley, but you do. Um, showing, uh, just summarize the evidence in RNA controls phase separation. And, oops, what am I doing here? Something's here. Right, so um, these IDRs, uh, intrinsically disordered regions, are present in and essential for the function of nearly all of the proteins involved in animal and plant development, not, not widely known. These include most classes of transcription factors, the HOPs proteins, the histones themselves, other chromatin modifying proteins mediated complex RNA binding proteins and spice factors. And the fraction of these IDR containing proteins in the proteomes of organisms correlates with number of specialized cell types. The sharp increases uh, between prokaryotes, simple eukaryotes and multi eukaryotes. In fact, this is the only part of the proteome that seems to correlate with developmental complexity. Finally, eukaryotic chromatin is organized in topologically associated domains which appear to be phase separated and regulated by enhanced RNAs. So here's some of the evidence, and again, um, it's not just uh, P granules and G bodies, but it's also heterochromatin, super enhancers, and transcription factors activating genes through the phase separation capacity of their activation domains. So the, 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 the story here is that basically it looks like the enhancer RNAs in particular, which is the, the majority of the long run coding RNAs, are actually forming and helping to, to establish topologically associated domains during development to control the patterns of transcription. Um, and uh, so this is a new lens on, on how uh, transcription is occurring and controlled by RNAs. Here's uh, uh, some in situ uh, experiments of a bunch of long non-coding RNAs. And you can see that almost every one of them is showing particular uh, patterns of chromosome territories and, and almost certainly phase separated domains. Um, I don't know why so now um, I just want to try to very quickly just give you a heads up on RNA as a substrate for epigenome environment interactions. And there are two types of RNA editing. First of all, adenosine to inosine, capitalized by ADARs. Uh, which occur in most animals. Um, and ADAR3 is vertebrate specific and brain specific. The function is unknown, but we have knocked it out in mice and they have learning and other difficulties. The other form of uh, uh, deamination is uh, apobec mediated cytosine deamination. And there are five families of these things, three of which are vertebrate, vertebrate specific, or well, they're all vertebrate, um, three of which are uh, uh, pan vertebrate, and two of which are uh, mammal specific. And one of these mammal specific families expands from one ortholog in mice to eight in humans with very strong signatures of positive selection. Now, um, the ADARs were first discovered uh, beautiful experiments years ago when people discovered that cloned cDNAs were different from the genomic sequence. And it wasn't mutation or sequence error, but rather 
post-transcriptional modification by editing. And it was, it was seen in these, um, you know, um, uh, neurologic uh, receptors genes. It was thought to be an idiosyncratic subset of neuroscience that was interesting, but just out there in left field. But in 2004, four papers were published about the same time, which showed that this was everywhere. It was uh, thousands of transcripts, mainly in non-coding sequences, implying that the editing is altering regulatory circuits in the networks, potentially influencing RNA-directed epigenetic memory. In other words, this is almost certainly one of the major sources of plasticity in the uh, epigenetic landscape, particularly in the brain. There's a massive increase in the amount of A2I editing in human RNAs compared to mice, 35 times increase, mainly in the brain, a mass majority of this occurs in analog sequences, which are primate-specific transposon drive sequences invaded in three ways during primate evolution, now occupy over 10% of the human genome. Widely considered to be the last transpositional storm of selfish DNA that hit our genome, but almost certainly, in my view, subject to positive selection as modular cassettes for RNA editing to superimpose plasticity onto an otherwise hardwired uh, RNA-based regulatory system. This, in this increases during primate evolution. This paper from uh, the terrific Israeli group shows that the sequencing of, um, uh, show that the, the, the editing level of transcripts analyzed um, in the human brain compared with human primates include, increases between humans, chimps, and, and rhesus monkeys. And that most of this is enriched in genes is so related to neurologic functions and neurological diseases, which I think is extremely telling. The apex, I don't have time to go into it because they're even more fascinating. Uh, the ones West characterizes AID, which is involved in somatic rearrangement, hypermutation of IgG domains and B cells and T cells. But this is the primate specific expansion here, which appear to control exogenous endogenous retroviral line one retrotransposition. But, uh, but this, uh, and again, thought to be a protective mechanism. Uh, to, to protect against those nasty retroviruses and, uh, and retrotransposons. But I prefer the explanation that they've been domesticated because Fred Gage and colleagues showed a few years ago that these things are actually moving around naturally in the in human brain, or oh, sorry, in human in neural cells, and presently say these things have the potential to contribute to somatic mosaicism in the brain. Uh, we showed in a group led to by uh, Jeff Faulkner that uh, this also occurs in the human gene. So transposon mobilization also occurs uh, in other stages of development too, that is a particularly strong and powerful force for uh, modulation of uh, somatic uh, uh, mosaicism in the human brain. My final quick set of slides is on RNA modifications as opposed to editing, which is deamination. And there's over 140 of these things, many of which are disease related, the ones in red here. This is work done by one of my postdocs, Eva Maria Pardo, who now has her own group in Barcelona. And um, I just want to give you one example of this. So we looked at this, uh, of all the uh, modifications, uh, you're limited to some extent by the tools you have available to study them. And Eva and colleagues are working out new methodologies for direct RNA sequencing using nanopore to get a better handle on the epitranscriptome. But one of the uh, interesting ones is the modification of MT2G. And there's two genes involved, TRIM-T1 and TRIM-T1-like. If you knock out TRIM-T1 in humans, you have intellectual disability. We don't know what the function of TRIM-T1-like, its ortholog is, but when you look at their expression patterns, and remember phase separated domains here, TRIM-T1 appears to be mitochondrially located, whereas TRIM-T1-like seems to be nucleolar, or is nucleolar located. This is in sushi's neuronal cells and culture. When you activate these cells uh, by tickling them with calcium potassium chloride, you see that TRIM-T1-like uh, uh, protein, which is nucleolar, leaves the nucleolus and moves out into uh, a, high, a high number of small uh, but discrete domains in the nucleus. Whereas TRIM-T1, which is mitochondrially localized, moves from the mitochondria into the nucleus and, and into a similar pattern of uh, subnuclear domains. But these things are different. So if we look at um, uh, TRIM-T1 and then TRIM-T1-like and merge them, we see that not one's moving from the mitochondria, that one's moving in the nucleolus, but they're actually ending up in different Subnuclear sub domains in the nucleus. This is extraordinary, the, the precision of this, that just neuronal activation can move 
the location of these RNA modification enzymes and then all their, their consequent um, activities from one cellular compartment to another. So I'll finish there just with a, uh, just a, a few final statements. Uh, the, the idea that the human genome on the GM's complex organisms are mainly full of junk is, is not correct. In fact, it's precisely the opposite. Our genome is not, you know, um, oases of protein coding sequences in a desert of junk, but rather islands of uh, protein coding sequences in a sea of regulation, which is largely transacted by RNA. And uh, I, I come to the conclusion that the human genome, I mean, rather than being information sparse, is actually very information dense, possibly the most information dense uh, software suite on the planet when you consider that it's only 825 megabytes of information and it produces you and me. Um, uh, thanks, I've tried to, uh, to mention colleagues on the way through, but uh, this work was done mostly in um, the University of Queensland and my uh, previous Institute for Garvin, I'm now at the University of New South Wales, uh, in conjunction with people from Rican and other places that I've mentioned on route. So uh, with that, I just show the pictures this, a few years ago of this gorgeous group of people who've uh, contributed so much to what I've uh, told you today. Thank you for your attention and very happy if there's enough time uh, to take questions or as long as you like. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Matik, for this absolute explosion of the complexity. And I think we are all got various neurons working full speed. I will take questions now. I think we can go ahead with quite a few of them. Uh, what we can do is you can raise your hands and uh, we will unmute you and you can ask your own questions if that works. Meanwhile, let me just start with uh, a question posted by an anonymous attendee. How long before we rename the non-coding genome in our genomics textbooks? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a really good question. By the way, somebody's got their, uh, um, their unmuted and got wind and making some background noise, so it might be good if they turned off the microphone. But, can, can I um, ask everyone to just check, turn off their mics? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, thank you. Uh, look, um, I think it's coming. Uh, there's been such allegiance to the transcription factor model, uh, and it's almost like the hegemony of transcription factors. And, you know, even enhancers are the classic uh, example of this. Enhancers, Mark Potashny drew a diagram of enhancer action, which posited that the transcription factors bound to the promoter of the enhancer, or bound to the enhancer, then looped around and contacted the promoter of the protein coding gene. Because uh, at that time, you know, nobody could really conceive the, the idea that, that, that the enhancers were producing, you know, regulatory RNAs. This, even though there were lots of isolated examples of regulatory RNAs, nobody was taking notice of them. And that diagram is still repeated in lectures and textbooks, you know, all around the world. Um, I, I'm actually just finishing a book on this, which I hope will make a difference to the way people think. But um, certainly, uh, there's been such long established allegiance to a transcription factor only paradigm of gene regulation that it's going to take a long time, I think, some time for people to accept that that was incorrect. Now, that's not to say transcription factors are not important, they are, but I would point out that the transcription factors all have intrinsically disordered regions. They actually address different subsets of promoters in different tissues which is either due to accessibility to those genes because of chromatin architecture or because they've been guided to those positions by RNAs. And in both cases, they're regulated by transacting RNAs. I'd mentioned, for example, the zinc finger transcription factors. This was a paper in Science in um, oh, 20 or so years ago. Actually, uh, the few that were looked at, including uh, SP1, actually have a, a higher affinity for RNA DNA hybrids than they have for double stranded DNA. Which, which would explain the loose consensus sequences if you have transacting RNAs that actually then bind to a subset in different cells. And that is what really guides the, uh, those transcription factors to particular sites and not others during development. So I think we have to rethink all of the ways we think about uh, the way the genome is regulated during development and, and the interplay between transcription factors, system modifying proteins and others and guide RNAs. <coughs> 
probably also should say, and I should have mentioned this, that this the fantastic advantage of this system, like with CRISPR and with RNA interference, is that you can have a generic infrastructure like a risk complex or a Cas9 complex or a chromatin modifying complex that is then guided to different positions by RNA. So you have a very flexible and efficient system of gene control. All right, thank you. Um, Fanny, you have a question? Mm. Hi, actually Nikhil here. I have a question. I have a couple of questions. Uh, so first of all, thanks for the wonderful talk. It was really amazing. And uh, I would like to know if other than mitochondria, uh, have you gotten non-coding RNAs in any other organelles? Oh no, the, the, most of the non-coding RNAs are in the nucleus. Um, when you I were talking about the activation of the cell, what exactly you meant? I was talking about the location of the RNA modification enzymes, TRIM-T1 and TRIM-T1-like. So, what, so these are enzymes that will modify on these and they're located in different subcellular compartments, one in the mitochondria, one in the nucleolus, but they move to the nucleus to other compartments on neuronal activation. So that was not talking about non coding RNAs, that was talking about the dynamics of RNA modification in response to neuronal activation, but just another level of complexity because it's clear that the non-coding RNAs that are regulating developmental processes are hardwired because you've got to put fingers and toes in the right places. But there is an, uh, there is an environmental plasticity, particularly in the brain. And I think that is being enabled by RNA editing and modification of trans, which was then changes their, uh, their interaction with the epigenome. I see. Uh, a couple of years uh, ago, there were some reports about non-coding RNAs interacting with the plasma membrane and triglycerides. Uh, did you ever come up with that or what is your take on those kind of non-coding RNAs at the membrane? Yeah, look, um, I'm not familiar with that, uh, but, but having written a, a chapter on the avalanche of long non-coding RNAs, I can say pretty confidently that you can find long non-coding RNAs that will be regulating almost every biological process. Um, sometimes uh, directly, um, uh, as scaffolds, for example, um, the 7SL RNA is, uh, you know, involved in the regulation of protein exploit. But most of them, I think, are, are, are controlling epigenetic trajectories. So uh, they're, they're everywhere. There are, um, oh, gee, uh, tens of thousands of publications on long non carrying RNAs now in many, many cases of validated experiments. Uh, uh, activities in different contexts, including regulating aspects of metabolism. Right. Thanks, John. Okay. Funny, you would like to go ahead? Funny? Oh, Surbi, I was... Uh, Surbi, okay, you're... I to do this? I, uh, All I right, good. To yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nikhil. All right, so we'll go ahead with, I can see Venkat. No, you have a question? Hi. Uh, Surbi. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Venkat. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering about these uh, recent reports on naturally occurring double-stranded RNA with potential regulatory functions. How okay. abundant are they and uh, how do you think they, their mechanism of action would be? Well, believe the reports. Um, uh, you know, over the years, just a philosophical point, first of all, over the years, when people make strange observations, they tend to be ignored and they shouldn't be because they're usually just early emissaries of broader processes. Double-stranded RNAs is um, very important in um, innate and immune response. They stimulate interferon, et cetera. And they're also the substrate for the whole RNA interference pathway. So um, uh, one thing I didn't get time to say is, for example, uh, DNA methylation patterns are clearly in plants and animals directed by um, the RNA interference pathway, siRNAs, which come from double-stranded RNA precursors. So, DNA methylation, which tends to be emphasized more than histone modifications because it's been easier to study traditionally, but in fact, I think it's less important in his, than histone modification, so important. But there's no question that is, that is uh, guided by um, 
the small RNAs that come from double-stranded RNA precursors. Right. Uh, but there are also reports uh, about uh, long non-coding RNA, uh, either sense and antisense RNA, you know, forming double-stranded RNA with potential functions, not the processed ones, but rather the naturally occurring. Yeah, well, I, I, I can't comment because, you know, there's, there's so many publications. I haven't looked at them in detail. Sometimes people assume that if they see sense and antisense transcription in the sample, um, that they are forming double-stranded structures. But so, so, you know, it depends on the evidence they produce. But I'll just point out one thing. We, um, we in that brain slide I showed earlier, we have a case where a protein coding RNA is expressed in Purkinje cells, whereas the antisense RNA that comes overlaps with and comes from the other strand is ex specifically expressed not in Purkinje cells, but in the single line of cells next to the Purkinje cells. So the sense uh, RNA is being produced in one set of cells and the next set of cells is producing the antisense. So it's clearly regulating something uh, in those other cells. So, but maybe, you know, if you just did a whole RNA seq and you saw both sense and antisense, you might make the assumption they're double stranded. I can't comment further than that, but um, okay. I wouldn't be surprised at anything. I, I think the complexity of RNA regulation is extraordinary and we've hardly scratched the surface of it. I agree. Thanks, John. Pleasure, Vicky. Annapurna, if you have a question, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. That was a really good talk. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you spoke about somatic retrotransposition. So has there been any evidence of that being associated with uh, sporadic cases of neurological diseases like uh, epilepsy? I'm not aware of any, um, but I wouldn't say no. Uh, the trouble with um, most studies up until recently is that the repeats, so-called, or the retrotransposed on drive sequences can't be mapped accurately from short read sequences. So they tend to end up in the bin on the side. Um, and the same is true for microsatellites, which clearly have a major role in, in, in neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. Long read sequencing is starting to solve that problem now. But I have to say, and I'm happy to send you a summary of the extraordinary range of both a normal and aberrant um, uh, biological processes that retrotransposons play a role in. It okay, great, thanks. Uh, my next question is, uh, yeah, please. Oh, well, I just Go ahead. By saying that the view that retrotransposons are mainly negative in their effects, I think is wrong. I think retrotransposons have been co-opted okay. as modular cassettes during evolution, and they're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're modular cassettes, exons in long encoding RNAs, they're new splice sites, all sorts of things. And that's not to say that aberrant, um, you know, um, activation of retrotransposons can't be damaging. But and, and there's a whole other story, of course, in sperm where it's. Uh, I think they're let out of jail for evolutionary reasons and then put back into jail through the Millie and Miwi pathways. But that, again, would be another 15-minute discussion. Right. Yeah, that's that's a new perspective for me. Thanks. Uh, so my next question is about um, that experiment you talked about where neuronal activation actually modulated uh, where the RNA modulators were lo localized, if I understood it correctly. So do you think that could be like a common pattern of how, uh, you know, epigenetic factors act because environmental changes like stress, for example, psychological stress, we don't entirely understand how it leads to epigenetic changes. So could this be uh, a common, you know, mechanism? I think it's almost certainly a mechanism. It's really intriguing to me that, these RNA modification enzymes have specific sub you know, cellular locations, and that is uh, altered on on you know uh, neuronal stimulation, environmental effect. But yes, the brain is intrinsically plastic in all sorts of ways, and I think the plasticity at molecular level is coming from RNA modification and editing, which has to be activated and, and, and directed in some way that we really haven't we don't understand at all. Nobody knows what uh, what the, uh, the regulatory pathways for these things is 
But I just say again, the thing I said very quickly in passing, which to me is very profound, that is that serotonin and dopamine, those two neurotransmitters at least, which are quite small molecules, are often probably linked to histones in the brain. So there's clearly an interplay between neurotransmission and the neural processes. You know, uh, you know, bet your bottom dollar that will also um, factor in stress. Okay, great. Thank you. There's another question. Can metastasis of cancer cells be related to the non-coding genome? Yes, there's uh, quite a lot of evidence for that now. Um, uh, the, the RNA that I mentioned in melanoma, hot air, there are many others. More and more cases of uh, long, long cutting RNAs in genetic disorders and cancers are coming to light. It looked early on, I used to get asked the question, how much, why, why haven't we seen more genetic evidence of long, long cutting RNA, you know, um, variational mutation in uh, cancers and, and uh, genetic disorders? And the, the answer was um, partly that protein coding uh, mutations are more catastrophic on the whole, but, but largely because people weren't looking. And now, you know, there are many, many references of uh, mutations or translocations or uh, in long cutting RNAs that affect the etiology and progression and metastasis of cancer. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see many other questions, but I'd like to ask a final one. Uh, how, how do we sort of wrap this up into a complete picture in my head as I try to expand this. You said like more than 100% of the genome is probably transcribing and we have so many transcripts. So what proportion of uh, the entire stretch is actually transcribed and what proportion is transcribed over and over in terms of sense and antisense? And do you think there's a location bias of the antisense that when they're located, are they more towards the promoter or the three prime UTR? What, what is your take on the overall picture of how active the genome is? Well, it's hard to answer. It's, um, you know, if you look at the Encode and Recon studies, they will tell you that you know, 85 or 90 percent of the genome is transcribed. But when you actually look at a particular low sign, like that diagram I showed early on, there's lots of antisense transcripts, and we know that. So um, it's clear to me that uh, more than 100 percent of the genome is transcribed in technical terms. It might not be every nucleotide is transcribed, but um, and well, I don't think we know the ex full extent of whether it's 120% or 180%, but, uh, and I can't tell you whether, uh, and I haven't seen any uh, or read of any bias in the location of the antisense transcript with respect to the five prime or three prime end of the protein coding genes. What I would say is that um, at the moment, we've got thousands of just-so stories about if you knock down these RNAs, you see something happen, or you see them mutated or translocated in disorders. Until we actually understand the structure function relationships of these things, a bit like PFAM, you think of proteins, you can say, well, that domain is a serine protease domain or a kinase domain. I think we're going to find that each of the domains in these long, long coding RNAs is a module and say, for example, that module binds polycone. Once we've identified what the structure that binds polycone is, we can map it normally places around the genome and all along our cutting RNAs. We know that the isoform that has that module is part of its cargo is polycone. So I think to get a, a rational framework for understanding the structure function relationships of these long run cutting RNAs, as opposed to just the biology, although that's really interesting, we have to go to that, that level. And that's yes. what we're trying to do. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is one final question from YouTube. If you don't mind, I'll just read that out. Are there any data on the role of post-transcriptional RNA modifications in bacterial adaptation to environment, especially in the phase separation or localization in bacterial cells? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Um, RNA modification is not nearly as, um, in fact, I'm not really that familiar with much to do with RNA modification in bacteria. Um, DNA modification in bacteria tends to be limited to uh, protection of sequences against restriction enzymes and, and, and so forth. You know. uh, but, uh, and there'll undoubtedly be, there's undoubtedly RNA modification, but how much it's used as a, uh, an environmentally responsible, responsive pathway. Uh, I don't know. A good question. Thank you. I'll go and look it up. Right. Uh, 
All right, I think I hope that answers everyone's questions. And so I think we end this session by a very warm thanks to Professor Matic. It was a pleasure to listen to this talk. Thank you so much for joining us and accepting our invite. Thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I look forward much. to coming again one day in person. Yes, that would be wonderful. We look forward to the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay.